Before each game, Hall of Fame baseball player Wade Boggs ate the same thing, chicken. To warm up, he fielded exactly 150 balls. For night games, he started batting practice at exactly 517. And before each turn at bat, he drew into the ground of the batter's box the Hebrew word for life, and he wasn't even Jewish. Why would an elite athlete perform such elaborate rituals? He did it because he thought it increased the odds of winning. In short, he was in the pursuit of certainty. We live in uncertain times, climate change, global pandemic, political division, gun violence, inflation, war. These problems leave us all searching for a greater sense of certainty. But we often think that our voices, our actions are too small to affect the change that we want to see. But what if the solutions were simpler than we think? What if through small, seemingly insignificant acts, we could catalyze the change that we want to see? As a scientist, I work with a unique kind of certainty, probabilities. My students and I study the evolution and conservation of marine ecosystems, and we devise experiments to test how these imperiled ecosystems function. The results of these experiments are statements of statistical probability. For example, an experiment might show that higher abundances of sea urchins create conditions more favorable for coral reefs to thrive, and that our results are only expected to be observed with the probability of one in 100. In other words, we are 99% certain that sea urchins, these small, often overlooked members of a marine ecosystem, can have a profound impact on the health and function of the ecosystem in which they inhabit. Early in my faculty career, I was reflecting on probabilities, but not related to a particular experiment or uh, analysis. Instead, I was reflecting on how improbable it was that I was a marine scientist. Now, there are obvious reasons why it's improbable that I'm a marine scientist, not the least of which uh, were strong declarative statements that I made in graduate school, such as, I never want to be a professor at a research-intensive university like Berkeley or UCLA. However, the reasons why it's unlikely that I'm a professor and marine scientist go deeper than this. It's unlikely that I'm a marine scientist because I'm Mexican-American. In 1997, the year that I earned my PhD, Latino and Latina students earned only 3.4% of all science PhDs awarded in the United States. That number drops to 0.37% in marine science. It's unlikely that I'm a marine scientist because I grew up in Tucson, Arizona. For those unfamiliar with Tucson, <laughs> Tucson, okay, you are familiar. It's a desert. I can't tell you the precise statistics, but I'm pretty sure that it's more unlikely to become a marine scientist growing up in the desert than it is growing up next to the ocean. It's unlikely I'm a marine scientist because I grew up in a low-income household. Like many of my generation, I grew up watching the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau and dreaming of being able to explore marine environments all around the globe. But financial realities being what they were made that seem as possible as going to the moon. It's unlikely I'm a marine scientist because I went to poorly performing schools. They were under-resourced. My middle school was the kind of school where you could be tapped on the shoulder, turn around, and see a 45 caliber handgun pointed at your head. I can tell you this because it was my shoulder that was tapped. My high school was the kind of high school where less than 40% of incoming freshmen continued on to graduation. We were visited by military recruiters rather than college recruiters because so few students went on to college. It's unlikely I'm a marine scientist because 
despite entering college with a dual interest in biology and music, I knew nothing about careers in science. And I had no idea that as I spent 15 to 20 hours a week rehearsing in the practice studio, that other students were doing the exact same thing, but in research labs all around campus preparing for careers in science. Combined, all of these variables made it incredibly unlikely that I would be a professor of marine science. Yet here I am. Probability does not equal possibility. And remarkably, the difference between me being here today and a different alternative outcome were surprisingly small. It was a fluke I went to graduate school at all. In my junior year of college, I took an animal behavior class and a herpetology class, and both professors required students to do a small research project. Needing to be efficient with my time, I figured I'd kill two birds with one stone, study the behavior of a frog, canyon tree frog. At the end of the semester, both professors came up to me and said, you know, you should go to graduate school and you should go to Berkeley. And so I did, uh, although I confess I, I don't know why. Um, <laughs> so I went to Berkeley to study the evolutionary genetics of the canyon tree frog, but a series of failures led me to bouncing around different projects, tree frogs, spotted hyenas, clownfish. I couldn't get a project to work. And the low point was when my PhD advisor left for a different institution, and I started my fifth year of graduate school with no advisor and no project. This is a perilous spot to be in, but a newly hired faculty member, Tyrone Hayes, brought me into his lab. And with the new beginning were new possibilities. Technologies had evolved, and I finished my PhD doing almost exactly the frog project that I had abandoned as impossible many years earlier. I transitioned into marine ecosystems as a postdoctoral scholar. And when I started going to marine science conferences, I was really stunned by the lack of diversity in the field. Today, the marine science workforce is only 4% Latino or Latina, 2% black. 25 years ago, it was even less diverse. And so as I was sitting in my office, reflecting on just how improbable it was that I, a Mexican-American kid from the desert, low-income household, who did a PhD on frogs, uh, was a marine scientist, I wondered, what could marine science look like if we focused more on possibilities and less on probabilities? In 2005, with funding from the National Science Foundation, I started the Diversity Project, a research-intensive summer program focused on diversifying marine science. We started small with just two students, but have grown to supporting 15 students a year. We recruit students from historically black colleges and universities, where students often have fewer research opportunities than schools like UCLA. We recruit students from schools that don't have marine science programs. We even recruit students like Hunter Howard. When Hunter applied to our program, he didn't know how to swim. But given the opportunity, he rose to the challenge. And we train Hunter and all of our students to scuba dive and to use scuba as a research tool to study the ecology and conservation of coral reefs in the South Pacific. And we mentor them to careers in marine science. To date, we've supported nearly 100 students, almost all black or Latino, Latina, and most of those students go on to graduate school. By focusing on possibility rather than probabilities, the Diversity Project is changing the face of marine science. Our alumni, our faculty at Yale, Penn State, UT Austin, UC Irvine, they are leaders in conservation organizations like the Nature Conservancy and the World Wildlife Fund for Nature. 
They sit on the boards of major scientific societies like the Association for the Study of Limnology and Oceanography, and they have founded their own known nonprofits focused on diversifying marine science, like Mahogany Mermaids and Black and Marine Science. But the Diversity Project almost never happened. And the events that led to the Diversity Project and to me being here today were a series of small, insignificant acts that made the incredibly improbable possible. I told you about how two professors said you should go to graduate school and you should go to Berkeley. What I neglected to tell you is that despite the profound impact that these words had on me and my career trajectory, neither person can recall ever saying them. <laughs> how often do we consider the impact of our words for good or bad? And how many more people might we inspire if we hi harnessed the power of our words? I told you that I went to Berkeley to study the evolutionary genetics of the canyon tree frog. What I neglected to tell you is that the faculty member who recruited me to Berkeley was a paleontologist with no expertise in frogs or genetics. And I had no interest in paleontology. But he saw the possibilities and gave me a chance. What might our society look like if more people were given the chance to turn probability into possibility? I told you about how I joined the lab of Tyrone Hayes. What I neglected to tell you is that the year I applied to graduate school, Tyrone was himself a graduate student, and my application was scheduled to be rejected. Tyrone happened to be the graduate student representative on the admissions committee, and he spoke up and advocated for me. How many more people might achieve their potential if more people were willing to stand up and advocate for them, and how might those individuals have transformed our society? Lastly, I told you about the Diversity Project and the amazing things that our alumni are doing. What I neglected to tell you is that at the university where I started my faculty career, I told my chair that I was going to start this program. He told me it's a waste of time, that I should instead focus my time doing research and writing grants. How many people have not pursued their passions because of the words of people who failed to see the possibilities? It's true, we live in uncertain times, and the challenges facing our society can leave us feeling powerless and sometimes hopeless. We think, I'm just one person, what can one person do? It is true, we are each just one person, but we all have power. The fact that I'm here speaking to you today is proof that even through small, insignificant acts, we can all turn the incredibly improbable into the possible. The solutions to climate change are out there. The solutions to infectious disease are out there. The solutions to political division, they're out there. But the people who will solve these and other critical challenges facing our society may not yet be on that path. They may need some encouraging words. They may need someone to give them a chance. They may need someone to speak up and advocate for them. They may need someone to unlock and unleash their potential. All it takes is one person, and we all have that power. The question is, how will you use it? Thank you.